ghost activity, fringe science, interdimensional beings, psychic phenomenon, and conspiracy theories. Does the truth exist? How close are we to finding it? Come listen and discover the answers yourself. Welcome to the Paranormal MD, where the out of the ordinary is discussed weekly. Join your host, Mary Marshall, and her guest as they inform, discuss, and entertain you. Talk radio just got weirder, wiser, and more interesting. Now, here is your host of the Paranormal MD Radio Show, Mary Marshall. Hello and welcome to the Paranormal MD. I'm Mary Marshall, your host. Thanks for joining me. Tonight is going to be a very um, interesting show. I have a guest on. His name is Jesse Pollock. He is a wonderful true crime writer. Uh, A lot of his stories have paranormal overtones to them, so you'll want to stay tuned for that. And, of course, we will be doing the ever-popular Weird World News. And I would like to let everyone know that this show is sponsored in part by Haunted Ashmore Estates. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be speaking at Ashmore Estates the weekend of September 9th. They are having a very special event. It is Ashmore Estates 100th birthday. It's going to be an awesome celebration and I'm honored to be a presenter there along with the likes of Ben Hansen from Factor Fiction, Christopher St. Booth and Rachel Marie Booth, Scotty Rourke and a whole host of other uh, paranormal celebrities. So I'm very honored to be among them at this event and the really really nice part about this is is that all of the proceeds are going to Lost Limb Foundation. There is so much going on at this event. There's going to be investigative um, tours that are led by myself and the other presenters. There's going to be raffles, auction, music. There's even going to be a wedding at this event. So you don't want to miss it. And just in case you are wondering where else I may be speaking, like how I segued into that. Um, I'm also going to be speaking at Dark Shores Ghost Con 8, which is the weekend of October 7th. And I'm going to be speaking at the Milwaukee Paranormal Conference the weekend of October 15th. So get on the internet and check all these out and get your tickets now. And I'd like to remind you that if you've missed any past shows, you can listen to them on demand at theparanormalmdradio.com or check out our YouTube channel or listen to the Paranormal MD Radio Show on iTunes. That's right, it's Weird World News. Well, Pam. Mary. You ready for some uh, interesting stories this evening? You know, I always am. <laughs> um, I, need, I would love for you um, to share a funny first story with us, please. Elderly British woman fends off burglar with bacon. Okay, well, I'm not sure about that title if that's funny, because I take my bacon very seriously. So do I. (laughs) But an 86-year-old British woman defended herself from a would-be robber in a supermarket by beating her over the head (laughs) with a packet of bacon. The unidentified female suspect followed the woman into the supermarket after witnessing her withdrawing a large amount of money from an ATM. The woman was reportedly safe after the encounter, but remained shaken up. <laughs> wow. I just I just love, love this story because it's just I, one, one more thing you can do with bacon, apparently. <laughs> you know, we love our bacon. I know. Okay. And if it's going to become my next weapon, all the more power to us. Deep fried bacon, bacon ice cream, and now bacon weapon. 
can't beat I'm that. Telling you. No. Can you conceal <laughs> carry and conceal bacon? I think you can. <laughs> See, you can get away with that one. Um, <laughs> I have a more serious um, story. Well, it is a serious story, um, but it's really weird. Okay, so here's what it is. The headline reads, A third of U.S. adults say they'd be enthusiastic about a microchip implanted in their brain. Developments in biomedical technologies are accelerating rapidly, raising new uh, debates. Here's where this starts leading to. A third of U.S. adults in recent research center surveys said they'd be enthusiastic about a brain chip to enhance their thinking power. The survey of 4,726 adults examined public attitudes about three emerging technologies that could improve a person's health, cognitive abilities, or physical capacity. Responses showed that a majority of American adults are uneasy or worried about all three. But in all three cases, at least a third of the respondents were enthusiastic. Using implanted brain chips to boost our thinking power, 69% worried versus 34% being enthusiastic. Editing of genes of babies to eliminate hereditary flaws and diseases, 68% worried versus 49% enthusiastic. Transfusing synthetic blood to people to give them much greater speed, strength, and stamina, 63% worried versus 36% being enthusiastic. While a majority in the survey say they are worried about human enhancements, 81% of U.S. adults expect artificially made organs to be routinely available for transplant in 50 years, and 66% of Americans say scientists will probably or definitely cure most forms of cancer by 2066. More respondents said they would not want enhancements of their brains, 66%, they don't want it, um, and their blood, 63%, then say they would want them, which respectively was 32% and 35%. Almost three quarters, 73%, believe inequality will increase if brain chips become available because initially they will be obtainable only by the wealthy. You the remember, wealthy can have them. Yeah. Do you remember I kind of we kind of I kind of talked about this because we were with the whole transhumanism thing. Yeah. And this was already a few years ago, and we were talking about brain chip. You know, putting brain chips in, and oh, you have a three-year-old put in a brain chip, and now they know five languages, and. You know, if this goes on, the inequality certainly is, a, I think, a real concern because it is going to be only available for the wealthy. And when I had that guy on the show, uh, David uh, Kekic from, um, oh my goodness, some, oh my, I just went blank on the foundation he's head of. But it was the whole transhumanism thing. I kind of got him to say this on air, which was, yeah. The wealthy are going to do it first. And his response to it was, the concerns of this is, hey, well, listen, um, you know, you've got a lot of people who are putting billions and billions of dollars into this now. And basically, long story short, he was saying, well, yeah, we put the money in. We're going to be the first to get it. They can have it. I don't need a chip in my brain to tell me how stupid that is. Yeah, but here's That's the th a dumb idea. But here's the thing. This is going to happen much 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 sooner i mean within decade some form of this is going to happen by the year 2030 this is going to be much more um accessible and it's going to happen where you're going to have the wealthy people who are going to get chips in their brain and or all these other things that they're talking about uh you know uh synthetic blood transfusions for greater speed speed and strength and stamina What's going to happen to those of us who cannot afford it? Well, I say let the wealthy be the guinea pigs and weed them out for the problems that are going to be caused by doing this in the first place. And then worry about those of us that can't afford it. Because I don't 
see that this is really going to be a good thing. See, I, I don't think so. I, I'm very, very worried about it. Because if you have somebody who has the capability of rivaling the intelligence of at computer speed, we're dead in the water. We're going to be worker bees. We're worker ants. They're sitting there and they will be able to control everything. The economy, um, people's lives. I mean, it is going to be very unequal. You mean worse than it already is? Because, oh, I mean, really, much. realistically. Much. <laughs> well, Just, now take, take the situation it is. Of the, those who maybe cannot afford um, higher education or things like that. If they, if they, and they can't even, maybe they're not even finishing high school. Let's just say because they have to get into the workforce to support family members at home or ailing family members and so forth. The the socioeconomic situation we're in now of those lower income people is only going to get even greater. You know, the haves and the haves nots. That's what it's going to come down to, and the haves are going to be able to control everything, including us. That part really frightens me. It's That's cool. Kind of scary. It's cool in one way because it'd be like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to just, you know, how often we said, you know, I don't want to learn this. I just want to know, <laughs> you know, it'd be nice. Oh, it'd, yeah. It'd be cool to do that. But combine that with a life extension because of uh, strength and stamina and other things, you know, uh, diseases being blocked out because you can afford to do things like, you know, gene editing and, and synthetic blood blood transfers and um, beyond replacing you know an organ is insurance going to cover a, a homegrown so to say organ <laughs> to replace your kidney if you need one they can afford to do that then we would not be able to wow it's, it's a very scary situation yes it is the ramifications of us needing to address this ethically now before we get to that place I think needs to to happen but that's just me and my thoughts on the matter. Yeah, but it's so scary. All right. Well, that was enough. Oh. That was enough seriousness. <laughs> uh, now we're on to well, the just stupid <laughs> 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 and the stuff that we find um, amusing. A uh, New Jersey woman gets stuck in cemetery tree while playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> I'm so that I'm, game is just so ridiculous. I know it is. It's just crazy, and all there's there's so many stories like this going around because of it. So this one is a fire department in New in New Jersey rescued a woman from a tree in a cemetery after she became stuck while playing Pokemon Go. The department warned players of the game to remain aware of their surroundings while playing the game. You think? <laughs> well, uh, there was one in the news this week about um, felon that was playing the game, and it took him to the, the front steps of the uh, police station, and he got arrested. So it's like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, if you're stupid enough to play it, I guess you are deserve to be arrested. <laughs> <laughs> the The other one in here, like, similar to that, is driver hits Baltimore police car. Blames dumb game Pokemon Go. <laughs> so because it lured him over there. <laughs> so apparently the the police uh, body camera was rolling when a driver crashed into an unoccupied patrol. He crashed into the patrol car. <laughs> And then when they went over there to check him to make sure if he was, you know, okay, if their passengers were okay, his only response was, man, the driver says, that's what I get for playing this dumb expletive game. I got to block that out. So this dumb, you know what, game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, People yeah. are unbelievable. <laughs> I, well, and not only that. Was this, I'm going to go back to that other story. What is this woman, a cat? What, she got stuck in a tree? <laughs> You're in a tree, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've not played the game, so I don't know exactly. Yeah, no, it doesn't seem like anything good comes of it. Oh, people, well, you know, that's not true, because people are actually exercising now. They're getting, they're out walking. Oh, well, okay. I guess I should start playing then, huh? <laughs> Unfortunately, they're not paying attention to where they're walking or climbing or get doing, but, you know, that's an entirely another thing. And 
if you thought those people were stupid. Uh, the police suspect documented Jeep theft in Snapchat videos. What? <laughs> a man accused of stealing a Jeep Wrangler in Maryland documented the theft in Snapchat videos and led investigators to his current location. Okay, kind of like the Pokemon thing. Yes. The Ocean City Police Department said officers determined a 1994 Jeep Wrangler had been stolen by a male suspect about 2 a.m. on Saturday and found it parked later in the morning at the condominium building with no sign of the suspect. The officers discovered about 8 p.m. Saturday evening that the man named Brian Engelman, 24, of Mastic Beach, New York, had posted a series of videos to social network Snapchat showing him stealing the Jeep and driving erratically on the condo to the condo building where it was found. Officers were able to record the videos and use Snapchat to discover where Engelman had returned to afterwards and arrested him. Engelman was charged, oh, imagine that. He was charged with vehicle theft and traffic violations, including negligent driving, driving with a suspended license, and, of course, using a handheld phone <laughs> while driving. <laughs> I love the last one. <laughs> and oh, just because you're that dumb, we're going to give you one for <laughs> using the phone while driving. It's this one. Ice cream shop experimenting with drone delivery on the beach. Well, you know, I love my ice cream. A seaside ice cream shop in Britain is experimenting with drone delivery frozen treats ordered by beachgoers using a smartphone app. A video posted to Facebook by drone operator Michael Kang shows how he used a powerful drone to deliver ice cream treats from Marblethorpe Rock and Ices to people sitting on the beach. Okay, I like that one. That's a good one. I knew. Could it bring me one now here? It see, but that's what it could do. Wouldn't it be nice to have drones just be dropping? I mean, they they probably do that with drinks and ice cream and everything else, and they just be like, you know, run it down and drop it to that person. And everybody's does, you know, you're paying on your phone now. You wouldn't even have to move. You could just put in the order, pay on your phone, keep your tan little behind in the sand and have a drink in one hand and ice cream in the other. I like it. Yeah, see, now that's making good use of a drone. (laughs) Exactly. Now you're talking my language. Ice cream. Yum. How do they keep it so it doesn't melt? Well, I would think it's uh, kept in maybe dry ice or something to that effect a little container you would open it up take it out put it back i wonder how many people would would steal the container yeah and how do they protect the drone a very long cable (laughs) hanging from it they can high fly up but again you're right i mean because you could because somebody could grab that and just pull it down and those are expensive yeah but There's there's cameras on them too, so you're being watched. They're gonna know if you vandalized it, and you'll be arrested, much like the oh, idiot yes. that Snapchat. His... Tying tying in these stories, yes, you will be arrested and charged with stupidity, um, using a handheld device while apprehending a drone <laughs> or something. Yeah, there's gonna be a whole new set of laws going on the books over those. Man. Because I did hear earlier in the week that um, I think it was Starbucks. Did the Starbucks or McDonald's? One of those chains also did a drone drop either last week or early this week. The first successful drone drop. Yeah. Of a, whatever the order was. There's a lot of companies now that are testing this out to see, you know, how viable it is. And uh, and we're well, we're finding our way. Gosh, that means Jimmy John's going to have to come up with a new slogan: "Freaky fast." And that'd be freaky, freaky fast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for Weird World News. Please stay tuned, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Have you ever wanted to spruce up the marketing material for your business? 
Have you ever wanted to turn those memories you have on slides or VHS tapes into DVDs? Have you ever wanted to create the perfect personalized video for a loved one? Then look no further. The sky is the limit with Chum Bucket Studios. Anything is possible because it all begins with a little imagination. Please visit www.chumbucketstudios.com for more information. Hi, this is Chin Hee Park. And this is Soon Hee Park. We're the Korean-Italian twin psychics. We listen to the Paranormal MD radio show. Check it out. It's too cool. Yeah, it is. Welcome back. You are listening to the Paranormal MD Radio Show, and I'm your host, Mary Marshall. I wanted to tell everybody about an exciting project that I've been involved with over the past year. As many of you know, I am a paranormal educator, which means I teach paranormal studies at the colleges and uh, other institutions around the Chicagoland area. Um, As a result, I mean, that came about from being an investigator and researcher. Um, I have uh, got involved in a case with uh, Jay Pachochin from WPI Hunts the Truth. Uh, He had been going out in uh, the woods, uh, what is it, southeastern Wisconsin, and um, I became enthralled with what he was experiencing and doing out there. As a result, we joined forces and started working together on this case. Now, here's the really cool part. We are going to have a documentary that will be released soon. The documentary is called Into the Woods, a case study on the Wisconsin Sasquatch and other phenomenon. Jay and I basically have combined years of uh, experience, and this documentary follows us over a course of a year of intensive research. Jay and I have very different approaches and techniques to investigating. Um, I'm the scientific researcher type, and Jay is the the think-outside-of-the-box believer. So, kind of think X-Files and a dollar store version of Mulder and Scully on a dime store budget. (laughs) at, At any rate, there's been various types of phenomenon going on out there. Um, as well as we were dealing with uh, the inherent dangers of of hiking uh, in the dark woods, you know, hiking in the woods at night. So this basically covers, this documentary covers some of the discoveries and some of the answers uh, that we have found in the research, but also shows that how two individuals who have very different investigative and research approaches and uh, we both have our own separate paranormal research organizations. This shows how people like this and like us can successfully work together and, more importantly, how beneficial it is for the paranormal uh, field when you have people like us work together to discover what the truth is that is out there. So stay on the lookout for Into the Woods, a case study of the Wisconsin Sasquatch and other phenomena. It will be released in September, and you'll be able to find it um, on my website, which is theparanormalmd.com, which is our my investigative research website, and it will also be at theparanormalmdradio.com. Uh, it will be at uh, Jay's website, I'm assuming, which is WPI Hunts the Truth. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be hitting other, you know, Amazon and other places also. But I wanted to give you a heads up, so stay tuned for that. That'll be coming out. It was uh, quite an experience. Um, a lot of very, very interesting things happened out there. Now let's move on to our guest for this evening. His name is Jesse Pollock. Jesse was born and raised in the Garden State of New Jersey and has been a contributing writer and correspondent for Weird New Jersey Magazine for the past 15 years. He's also an accomplished musician, which I didn't know, and his soundtrack work can currently be heard on the PBS documentary series 
driving Jersey. Jesse was on my show previously, right before the release of his last book, Death on the Devil's Teeth, was released in 2015, along with his co-author of that book, Mark Moran. The Strange Murder That Shocked Suburban New Jersey. This was a true crime story that really involved paranormal overtones as far as how it was being perceived. The book chronicles the haunting 1972 murder of Jeanette De Palma, and it quickly, quickly, I must say, became the fastest-selling title for History Press. The first print run sold out in less than 12 days, and the book is currently now in its fourth printing. In November 2015, Weird New Jersey Magazine released a special collector's issue compiled and co-edited by Pollock, entitled True Crime Files, Weird New Jersey. Pollock authored several brand new articles exclusive to this special issue. Uh, it is available at Barnes & Noble stores throughout New Jersey and online. Then, in early 2016, Pollock was commissioned by Simon & Schuster Publishing to write The Acid King, a brand new account of the brutal 1984 murder of Gary Lowers, a Long Island teenager. Lowers was stabbed to death by his friend Ricky Casso over ten stolen bags of PC. He was buried in a shallow grave, and Casso, a local drug dealer, led tours to the decomposing body for three weeks until he was finally apprehended by the Suffolk County Police. Casso confessed and shocked investigators by claiming Satan had given his blessings to the crime. His short life was over, but the series of acts gives birth to a wave of satanic panic all over the world. The Acid King will be released by Simon & Schuster in 2017. I'm very excited to have Jesse back on the show. Uh, he is just a wonderful writer. We're going to talk to him a little bit about his past book, Death on the Devil's Teeth, and then we're going to get into this true crime story, The Acid King. And without further ado, let me introduce Jesse. Jesse, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing fantastic. I am so excited to have you back on the show. It, oh, it's a pleasure. You, We had you on last time, um, actually before the release of your last book, which was The Devil's Teeth, um, and we you know, were, were discussing a lot of things. Um, before... Mm -hmm. We get into your talking about your new book, which I, it just it seems so enthralling already at this point. Um, I was hoping that we could talk a little bit about, again, um, The Devil's Teeth, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, because uh, uh, the, the last time we, we spoke, which was, oh gosh, I think it was maybe, I think it was January 2014, something around there, we were still... Um, we were still in the heavy research phase, and we were we were writing a little bit of it, but we were still um, mostly dealing with um, tracking family down, retired police officers, stuff like that, getting people to go on the record about the uh, the death of Jeanette De Palma. What, um, I'm gonna stop you. Give us a little rundown on what the Devil's Teeth is about. Sure. Um, now, uh, for those that didn't catch uh, that episode, basically, um, I got my start writing uh, through a, a magazine that comes out twice a year in New Jersey that's called Weird New Jersey. Um, if you don't live in the Garden State, you might remember the show Weird U.S. from the History Channel. Yes. The two guys that hosted that show, uh, Mark Moran and Mark Skirman, they're the, the geniuses behind Weird New Jersey. This is a, a very well-beloved magazine that's been out... Um, for about a quarter of a century now, I think. I think they've been they've been doing this for 20, 25 years. Well, um, what had happened was um, in the late 90s, the very, very late 90s, um, they got a letter um, from a gentleman named Billy Martin saying, oh, I, you know, I love your coverage of the Wachung Reservation, which is a, a supposedly haunted patch of woods in central New Jersey. But, uh, you guys are only scratching the surface. Uh, near the Wachung Reservation, there was a 
uh, supposed ritual human sacrifice in the 1970s, um, and the cops discovered it because a dog brought a body part home. Uh, I don't know if this is urban legend or true, but this is what I heard growing up. So that kind of set off this firestorm of people writing into the magazine all anonymously. Um, sometimes these letters were typed on a typewriter, no signature, no return address, nothing. Just saying, like, yes, it's true. Her name was Jeanette De Palma, and uh, she was found on an altar in the woods. She was sacrificed, yada, yada, yada. Wow. And the Marks tried looking into it, and uh, for a while they couldn't find anything. I mean, you got to remember, uh, this was these were the days before Google. Right. And, I mean... <sighs> It was just, you know, well, let's call the police departments, let's go to the the libraries and find out what the story is behind, you know, this Jeanette De Palma person. And at first they found nothing, and then finally they got a, a, an anonymous letter that had some dates um, relevant and, and like, a more um, concise location of where this event was. It was not in the Wachung Reservation, it was actually a few miles away inside the Hudai Quarry in Springfield Township. So with that information, they were able to go back on microfilm and find all these newspaper articles, very, very sensational newspaper articles, um, headlines like, uh, you know, uh, witchcraft ritual, you know, eyed in death of teenage girl, uh, all this, you know, a, a satanic cult. Uh, basically, what they were able to find out through these articles was on August 7th, 1972, uh, 16-year-old Jeanette De Palma uh, left her house on Clearview Road in Springfield, told her mother that she was going to go take a train to go see a friend in Berkeley Heights, and never came home. Never made it to the train station, uh, never made it to the friend's house. Um, they reported her missing. The police said, well, you know, we'll look into it, but they didn't take it very seriously because, you know, by their own account, kids were running away all the time in right. Springfield. They didn't really take that stuff seriously because they would come back home within a day or two. So no news for six weeks. Then finally on September 19th, 1972, a dog whose owner lived at the uh, Baltus Royal Garden Apartments in Springfield brought home a decomposing human arm. Ooh. Obviously an incredibly shocking discovery. Wow. And so... um. They called the police, the owners of the dog. Um, they, there was a foot search, and eventually they found about a mile away from the apartment um, the, the, the rest of the decomposing remains of Jeanette De Palma. She was found on top of a cliff inside this rock quarry that had been known to locals for decades as the Devil's Teeth. Because if, if you're standing on the quarry side of this cliff, if you're standing on the quarry floor... It, and I've been there, and Mark took you know there's a there's a there's a picture of it on the cover of the book. It looks like an upside down skull, and it looked even more so like one back then when the quarry was in operation, because these these rock trucks would dump piles of rocks along the ridge, and it would make it look like teeth. So hence the name, the Devil's Teeth. Uh, what really propelled this case into the realm of urban legend was um, word started to leak out to the press about 10 days after Jeanette's body was found that, oh, well, you know, we, we found these weird objects arranged around the body. You know, there were little crosses found around the remains. You know, there were logs arranged around the skeleton in the shape of a coffin or you know stuff like this and then it snowballed out of control to the point where people were saying oh no i heard that there were animal sacrifices near the body you know there were you know birds you know in jars and and small animals hanging from the trees and you know and you know wow. and anything that gets the suburbanite imagination going so the, the press ran with it. They ran with the satanic uh, witchcraft angle. It sold a lot of papers. But what it didn't do was help solve the case at all. As soon as the, right. the press started going wild with this, the police, you know, stopped 
you know, commenting officially on it. They felt the press was hurting the case or, you know, others believe that there may have been police involvement in the death. And that explained the kind of press blackout from them. But um, either way, no, no arrest. Nothing was ever solved. They couldn't even because of the decomposition, they couldn't even determine a cause of death. The, the remains were so badly decomposed. Um, wow. The most that they could figure at her autopsy was it was uh, possibly strangulation. So the Marks had this information. Uh, Mark Moran, my co-author and my, uh, you know, my, my boss at We're New Jersey, he's one of the co-founders, co-editors. He typed up this uh, seven-page spread in issue number 22, which came out in 2004, and it was one of the most, if not the most, well-received um, issues of Weird New Jersey because of this spread. I mean, it really, really connected with people. Uh, a lot of people from Springfield remembered the case, and they're like, oh, you know, it's so surprising that you know people are still talking about it after all these years because, you know, within two weeks of her body being found, no one ever spoke about it again. Right. It was very strange. It was all hush hush. You know, you, no one wanted to talk about it in school. The papers wouldn't talk about it anymore. The police refused to talk about it. So, you know, it, it really touched a nerve with the readers. And, you know, I guess they they anticipated more information would come in and nothing did. So fast forward to 2011, um, early 2012. Uh, I, I, you know, I was going through my back issues and, and, and I had a little article in issue 22. So I was flipping through it again, you know, taking a walk down memory lane. And uh, I, I happened upon the, the Jeanette article again. So uh, I called up Mark and I said, hey, um, you guys, uh, you guys hear anything more about this case since then? I mean, by, by this time, it'd been almost 10 years. And he said, no, you know, and it, it kind of trailed off after that. And I figured, you know, by then someone must have, you know, written a, a really good book about the case by that point. And sure enough, no one had. So I decided, well, I'd really like to read a book about this case, so I guess I'll have to write it. So Mark and I teamed up and we we went through all of our files together, found new pieces of information. We were able to track down Jeanette's family. We were able to track down the officers that um, that discovered her body. Um, by amazing. the way, both of which do not agree on what was found around the remains. One of the officers says, yes, there was a cross and there were stones arranged around the body. The other officer says, no, there was nothing. <laughs> so that adds, <laughs> to give you an idea of the intrigue right. of this case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, And confusion. We track I'm these... trying to figure out what's fact and yeah, what you... isn't. Because, yeah, because it puts you in a place where... Um, you know, a lot of other authors would say, well, um, I guess I'm going to have to pick a side uh, over which cop's um, recollection I'm going to side with and present in the narrative in the book. Whereas Mark and I, um, to some criticism, but, you know, the, the, this was the only way to objectively do it, we decided, well, we're going to take a step back and we are going to let these officers speak for themselves by presenting, you know, their quotes, you know, well, you know, to the reader here, this is what this officer says. And this is what that officer says. Compare that to the data we're presenting with you, because there's there's no photos in the book of the crime scene. Mark and I fought for two and a half years with the Union County Prosecutor's Office to let us have some view of the crime scene, even after, you know, the, the body was removed. You know, we understand that the, the they wouldn't want a uh, ghoulish, grim, Something you know, body photos. right. Yeah, but we said, listen, can we at least see the photos that were taken after the body was removed so we could, you know, put to rest once and for all if anything was arranged around the body? And they said no. Wow. Uh, why do you time and time is, again. What is your opinion on why they refused? I, I I'm honestly at a loss for it. I mean, if I were a, if I were a more sensationalist author, you know, if I, if I was one of the the Jesse Ventura types, I'd be like, it's a conspiracy. The cops were involved, and they don't want you to see the clues. But 
I mean, I try very hard not to to lean towards that, but at the same time, I'm well into my second book, and even the first book, there were other there were other cold cases that we found connections to, where the police departments gave us the files that we wanted. Um, I uh, for the book that I'm writing right now, literally two nights ago, I got an inch thick Manila folder in the mail from the Suffolk County Police Department, uh, all the files that I asked for under the Freedom of Information Act, they all gave it to me. So, this, so the Union County Prosecutor's Office um, is the, the weird loan uh, entity in all this that said, no, we're not giving you anything. We're not going to give you any crime scene photos. And I said, okay, well, can we at least see the, the, the written field report? You know, when an officer responds to a crime scene, not only do they extensively photograph it, but usually they will have an investigator there that is sketching out details, making a diagram, labeling everything. Right. That's and uh, I said, well, well, can we see that? You know, what's the harm in seeing, you know, a stick figure diagram? They said, nope. They would <laughs> not even let us see the call log for when the resident at the apartment complex called in about the arm, which we asked for so we can know what time of day the call came in. To this day, we have received zero documents pertaining to the the death of Jeanette De Palma from the Springfield Police Department who maintained their copies were quote-unquote destroyed in a flood or from the Union County Prosecutor's Office who tells us, yeah, we have them, but we're not going to let you see them. And it's such a shame because... I mean, obviously, a lot of years have passed, and you're trying to put something in perspective. And I, and I can say that I understand <clears throat> anyone's um, apprehension, I guess, in some to some degree, because they do, mm-hmm. they're not familiar. But as time goes on, and they certainly can see how you are respectfully look, you know, looking into this and and, and writing this story, you would think mm-hmm. that they would want to clear things up themselves or contribute. To it. That's it is really at. Before we continue on, I need to take a quick break. So all of you listening, don't go anywhere. We will be right back and smile. Have you ever wanted to spruce up the marketing material for your business? Have you ever wanted to turn those memories you have on slides or VHS tapes into DVDs? Have you ever wanted to create the perfect personalized video for a loved one? Then look no further. The sky is the limit with Chumbucket Studios. Anything is possible, because it all begins with a little imagination. Please visit www.chumbucketstudios.com for more information. Hi, I'm Sylvia Schultz, paranormal investigator and author, and you are listening to the Paranormal MD Radio Show. For everything that goes bump in the night, check out the downloadable podcast at theparanormalmdradio.com or visit the Paranormal MD YouTube channel. Welcome back. I'm Mary Marshall, your host. You are listening to the Paranormal ND Radio Show. If you would like to know more about the ongoings of the show, me, as well as past or future guests, you can go to the Paranormal ND Radio Show.com. Now let's get back to our very interesting guest interview with author Jesse Pollock. Your new book is called, that you're working on right now, is called The Acid King? Yes. Now you and you have not had these experiences of opposition with the police department at all with thus far anyway um in researching this book correct M- mo- mostly not um like I said I just got all of uh 90% of what I asked for from the Suffolk County Police Department for this case I got no problem um, some of it was a little redacted for privacy reasons, but, uh, you know, going back a little bit, Mark and I told the Union County Prosecutor's Office, we said, we have no problem receiving redacted documents. We're not trying to get anyone's name or personal information from these case files to go and, and bother them. We just want to know what was really found around, you know, this this young woman's body so we don't go and print lies. 
You know, the family's gone right. through enough between the New York Post and the New York Daily News. We don't need to add flame to the satanic panic fire. But uh, absolutely not. We even offered to sit down with them and say, listen, we've collected 10 years worth of data on this, data that you might find useful. Can we at least meet and compare notes? Maybe we can help you guys out. And they turned it down. So that just shows how, in, you know, how interested the Union County Prosecutor's Office is in solving the, uh, the murder of Jeanette De Palma. But um, it makes as me far- think it's 1972 mm-hmm. all over again with the, the social outlook and attitude towards it from them. You know, oh, yeah. It, it's, it's you would think you would think new cops, new chief, new whatever, you know, there, if there was some sort of a cover up or some sort of bias back then, it would be long gone. But if anything, it seems worse. At least the cops were talking to the newspapers back then. Now we can't get anything from them. It's you know what? As from an outsider perspective, my perspective on this, or is that um, it makes it very suspicious of how for me from them not doing that. It makes it more suspicious into what did they do things incorrectly? Did you know? Mm-hmm. I start questioning all these things, and I would as a reader. Uh, uh-huh. if, if I knew that they're not being cooperative, it just throw it just casts more of a shadow on things that something's not right, and it points to and again my just my opinion uh, towards well, that. and 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 another interesting thing too, uh, uh, you know, corresponding with that opinion is ninety percent of the retired officers that Mark and I interviewed for this book are under the, you know, their opinion is, and this is an opinion that they crafted themselves. There was no evidence at the scene uh, and no no anecdotal evidence from Jeanette's f- uh, family and friends to support this at all. But they feel that, oh, you know, she was probably some hippie wild child kid and she just went up there to get high and uh, died of an overdose. Well, one, if she was just some teenager that accidentally died of an overdose in the woods nearly half a century ago why the big cover up why why right. wouldn't you let a reviewer uh, you know or anyone a writer a reviewer a journalist see even redacted um p- portions of the case file you know if it's just yeah. if it's just some kid that died you know what's the big cover up two why are the, why are these officers saying that when a you know you ask them oh well, why did you come to that conclusion was there paraphernalia found around the body uh well no well were, were was there were there drugs found in her system at the autopsy uh no no they couldn't really uh, find too much because of the the decomposition uh no well what about track marks did you find track marks on the remains uh no no we didn't uh okay well did did the family tell you that she was using no no they didn't well d- did her friends tell you they they knew her to be a drug <laughs> user uh n- n- no. No, they didn't. So none of it makes any sense. And, and we interviewed several of Jeanette's friends, inc- including her best friend that she was going to go see that day. And she said, Jeanette, a hard drug user. She goes, let me t- let me tell you about Jeanette's knowledge of of, uh, of of drug use. She goes, we used to raid my father's liquor cabinet when we were 15, 16 years old. Jeanette would take a shot of uh, of liquor. And she looked at me one time and said, should we jump up and down so we get drunk quicker? <laughs> yeah, that's that that's someone with some some real knowledge of how to how to get a buzz on, how to get high. Right. So n- n- absolutely none of it none of it makes any sense. Uh all signs point to the fact that she was murdered. I mean, she, she was not up there to get high. This was an active construction site in 1972 you know it was run by the who die construction company they were mining minerals out of there so what sense does it make even if you're a 16 year old and 16 year olds you know i I was 16 once i remember it i was not the brightest crayon in the box you know you're still not dumb enough to go oh man i need somewhere to get high you know what it's and and she disappeared monday on a monday afternoon at one o'clock you're not that's that's the height of the work day. You're not going to go to an active construction site to get stoned. Yeah. So, it's none of it makes any sense whatsoever, but and and 
the, the, the cops are doing absolutely nothing to clear the myth up. I understand that certain files need to be protected, and there's also a matter of taste. You don't want gruesome photos getting out there. But, you know, certain things that should be public record, like when the phone call came in reporting the arm, stuff like that, they're holding. They will not show it to anyone. And to this day, a, a year after the book was uh, published, a year to the day, mind you, uh, we still have no idea why they're they're not releasing this information. It is just all very, very suspicious. And, and, and it, all the more reason of thankfully for somebody like you who's taking the time and and taking on the very arduous task of um, researching this and putting at least what you have been able to find out you because earlier you said something and I I really um, mm -hmm. liked it where you had said you know you're presenting you're gonna let the the um, opposing police officer stories speak for themselves Rather than imposing and saying, you know, from your perspective, and this is what happened, and this is the conclu you know, the conclusion, and choosing a side, because I think that's really oh, yeah. important as an investigator or an investigative writer to do that. I think it's your job is to, you know, um, find all the possibilities, present them, and as you do that, it's up to your readers to determine what they find as their truth in it. Oh, yeah. And, and, and even if I wanted to, uh, you know, okay, Mark, we're going to pick this side and we're going to go with this, it, it wouldn't have been practical. It would have been impossible. This, this was a case where every time we thought we had one question answered, three more questions would pop up. You know, uh, half the people we talked to was, oh, you know, Oh, yeah, I remember Jeanette. I loved Jeanette. Jeanette was this, this she was this innocent, you know, uh, Catholic schoolgirl. We did Christian outreach work together, and all she wanted to do with her life was serve the Lord. And then the other half of people we would talk to would be like, oh, man, Jeanette. Jeanette was cool. She, you know, she used to smoke pot with us, and, you know, she wanted to be a rock star. And, oh, you know, she loved, you know, she loved to party, and she was rebellious, and she, you know, didn't care about the church anymore and all this. So it was, it was just a matter of there were so many, you know, polar opposite yes. conflicting viewpoints. It was just, well, we have to present it all, and... You know, you know, some readers don't like that. A lot of readers like things tied up in a nice little bow, and we understand that. But, I mean, one of the biggest draws to this case is just how large the gray areas really are. You know, yeah. you know, with a case, a lot of these cold cases, you know, you watch them on the TV, you know, there's usually a very clear portrait of the victim we know about, you know, you know, some background, at least. You've got people, the family, friends, giving, you know, uh, recollections, all this. But with this, Jeanette is very much a literal ghost. You know, no one agrees on the type of person she was. And, you know, maybe that all can just be chalked up to, well, she was 16 years old, she was finding herself, and Jeanette showed different sides of herself to other people. But no one else really seems to apply that context when they're when they're giving the recollections of her. It's no, what everyone else is saying is wrong. What I remember is true. And then you talk to the next person. Don't listen to them. Listen, I know the real story. So it's a lot of weird stuff it like that. Certainly, definitely is. You know, <laughs> I find it interesting that this now the the, the devil's teeth that story that book. And now your new one is, again, it has to do well, you know, uh, with a, a, a case that's a murder case, but again, involving some possible uh, either, I'll just say at this point, paranormal or demonic, I don't know mm -hmm. how you want to say it, overtones to it. Um, it seems that this, I, has this been something, before you even tell me about the new story, um, mm -hmm. Has this was this sought out by you, or did this type of writing and research almost find you now? 
I would say that it found me. Um, when I was uh, writing for Weird New Jersey, the stuff that I was writing in about was kind of quirky property, you know, coincidences found on street signs. Um, uh, one, The first article that I wrote for them was about um, – I come from uh, – an area of central New Jersey where the majority of my family has ties to Perth Amboy, which is which is a city in central Jersey. And back when my father and mother were kids, there was a uh, a mental asylum in Perth Amboy where the patients were more or less free to come and go as they pleased. So there, okay. <laughs> my dad and mom had a lot of stories for me about interactions with these people. Nothing bad, nothing nothing humiliating or, or violent or anything. They were just they were just quirky guys. There was a guy called Bowler Jim who used to stand on one of the four corners in Perth Amboy and he was he was just constantly swinging an imaginary bowling ball. And everyone would honk and wave and say, "Hey, Jim." And um you know, uh, there was one guy everyone called Aqualung because you know he looked like the dude on the Jethro Tull album cover. So <laughs> they were just they were just the, the quirky. You know, they they were they were almost like the you know cue audience laughter. Here's the quirky neighbor coming in on the sitcom of their lives. You know, they yeah. they didn't really bother anyone, and no one hopefully bothered them. So I would write in about stuff like that, and and the occasional you know ghost story. I was not a true crime writer. In fact, when I you know, when I was uh, working on some long form writing, you know, I, I wanted to do horror fiction. You know, I'm, I'm I'm very much inspired by you know Stephen King, but this case just just fell into the lap of Weird New Jersey, and and it really connected with Mark and I, and we said, well, if no one else is going to do this story, we have to do it. Otherwise, it's going to fade into oblivion. Okay. So once once Death on the Devil's Teeth came out. Um, my agent Eric Myers, he called me up um, in the fall and said, um, "Hey, uh, Simon and Schuster um, is looking to do some more, you know, true crime work. You know, do you have a case in mind that might be, you know, similar to Death on the Devil's Teeth? Something that might, you know, complement it well." And the first thing that came to mind was the Ricky Casso case, um, which was something I became familiar with while working on Death on the Devil's Teeth. I was looking on other, uh, quote-unquote, satanic panic cases. And um, the background of it is quite extraordinary. Basically, in 1984... Um, in a place called Northport, Long Island, which is about an hour outside of New York City, um, a 17-year-old boy by the name of Gary Lowers was murdered by his friend Ricky Casso. He was stabbed to death, and his body was left in the woods. And what was really horrific about it was his murderer, Ricky Casso, was leading tours to the body for two weeks. What? And no one called the police. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Finally, um, one of the other witnesses to the murder that was up in the woods that night told his girlfriend and a friend of his girlfriend, oh, yeah, you know, uh, Ricky killed Gary. Do you want to go see the body? And finally, the friend of the girlfriend was just like, uh, this, this, is, this is crazy. She called Gary's family to see if it was a joke. And she, she just called Gary's mother and said, hey, uh, is Gary home? She said, no, I haven't seen Gary in two, three weeks now. And the thing about that, too, is um, Gary's family didn't report him missing because Gary yeah. would come and go. Gary, Gary would come and go as he pleased. There was a problem, a very large problem in Northport in the early 80s with the teenagers. There was just there was rampant drug use. There was there was a huge problem with. Uh, and this is where the uh, the title, the Acid King, comes from. The Acid King was Ricky Casso's kind of tongue in cheek nickname amongst his friends in Northport because he was the chief supplier of LSD and PCP and what they thought oh. was mes what they thought was mescaline. Um, they called it mescaline, but it was uh, it was those purple micro dots from the '80s that was actually like it was dirty acid cut with strychnine or PCP. Oh my god! And so, so yeah, the, to give you an idea of the problems, you know, in this little Long Island village, the chief drug dealer in that town was a 17 year old boy who was going into to, uh, the Bronx to get it. 
So that's one of the reasons why Gary wasn't reported missing. These teenagers just kind of came and went as they pleased if they weren't already kicked out of their homes like Ricky was. Ricky was kicked out of his home at 14 and was living in the woods. So, uh, like I said, um, this young woman called called Gary's uh, family. They said they hadn't seen him in three weeks. So that was when she really began to feel like, oh, my God, this, you know, this may not have been a joke. So she she anonymously called the police, and after three days of searching, they found Gary's body. The next day, they found Ricky Casso and his alleged accomplice, Jimmy Troiano, sleeping in a car over by the Northport Yacht Club. And Ricky confessed right away. He said, yeah, yeah, I, I stabbed him. I killed him. He stole 10 bags of PCP from me. And um, while I was stabbing him, I heard a crow caw, and that's Satan's. Uh, that's a sign from Satan that he's pleased. So oh. the cops th- are experiencing this double shock of, oh my God, this is a very, very brutal murder of a 17-year-old committed by a 17-year-old. And now he's sitting in our office telling him, basically, the devil made me do it. So the national press just descended on Northport. And this is where it's the polar opposite of the De Palma case. The De Palma case was covered by a few major metropolitan newspapers, you know, the the Star Ledger, the New York Daily News, uh, the New York Post, etc. Um, and then faded away after a week. Some say deliberately, you know, that there was a gag order or a cover-up. Well, with the Casso case... I am t- uh, Japanese reporters went to Northport. The London Times was in Northport. Oh my goodness! Tom, yeah, Tom Brokaw, Peter Jennings, uh, uh, Diane Sawyer. This was international news within 24 hours of Ricky and Jimmy being arrested. Well, unfortunately, uh, what added, what further added to the mystique of this case was as soon as Ricky Casso was transferred to the county jail, he hung himself. Oh, so no one was really able to see Ricky Casso cross examined in court to see like, oh, come on. You know, the devil really make you do it or were you high? I mean, you know, come on, you know, be be straight with us. He yeah, yeah, he he got to spook the world and then (laughs) and then checked out. And so when a situation like that happens, it, it just lets the myth perpetuate. And so, you know, there there are, God, there are dozens of heavy metal bands that love writing songs about this case, about, you know, the Long Island Satan killer and all this. And, and, and the, the New York Daily News and the New York Post, they did not help things at all with it. They, they latched on to this idea that Ricky Casso may have been the quote-unquote leader of a, again, quote-unquote, satanic cult operating in Northport called the Knights of the Black Circle. Now, if you're not from Northport, you read that in the newspaper, that's horrifying. And also, you know, not to sound like, you know, anti-hipster or anything, but you got to remember, these are the days of pre-Google. People saw something in a newspaper. They said, well, it's in the paper. It's got to be true. So the world was panicking at this. They were like, what are our kids doing? 17-year-old Satan cult? But what are... what it really was was the quote unquote Knights of the Black Circle. They, 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 Ricky was not a member of them. They they it was a a pseudo gang of teenagers that hung out three years before Ricky killed Gary. They they dealt a little bit of pot and they hung out in the woods and drank together. There were no animal sacrifices. There weren't. There was no chanting in robes. You know, it was it was almost like a biker gang without bikes. Is the way mm-hmm. I like to look at it but somehow some sort of uh tip was given to these sensational papers saying oh yeah you know ricky may have been the leader of this cult and it's perpetuated for the last 32 years and that was a big deciding factor in why i i chose this case to write about it was another case where i have an opportunity to kind of kill the myth that these uh, you know national enquirer types put out into the ether, 
And if no one else does that, you know, 50, 60, 100 years from now, people are just going to continue to assume, oh, yeah, there was a cult on Long Island and their leader, right. you know, killed a 17 year old boy. But no, it was a it was a drug murder. He was no, ticked off. Right. He, he was he, he, Ricky Casso was furious with Gary Lowers because Gary Lowers stole 10 bags of PCP from him while he was passed out. You know, uh, the, the whole Satan aspect, you got to remember, these kids were all high in the woods. And Ricky, Ricky didn't dabble in Satanism. I mean, he didn't sacrifice any animals or hold any rituals, um, you know, like that, that, that can be proven. There's a lot of gossip, but there's nothing concrete about it. You know, he knew as let me put it to you this way. When people ask me, like, oh, was Ricky Casso a true Satanist? I say, go go down to Northport and um, go look at the uh, the sidewalk across the street from the Green Dome Church. Uh, one of Ricky's friends tipped me off about this. Go look at that sidewalk. You will see carved into the sidewalk. It says Seth is Satin. And that was put there by Ricky Casso, you know, goofing, goofing on his friend Seth. He couldn't spell Satan. It was Satin. And there's pictures of spray-painted graffiti from Northport back in 1984. These kids were, you know, getting their idea of Satan from, you know, whatever was in their public library, whatever the New Age section at the Village Bookstore had, and whatever they could find on, you know, Ozzy Osbourne album covers. Right. This was... So, it was... Yeah, because it was, that whole period yeah. of time, there was a lot of that just influence and in music and everything else going on, and... I mean, even just from what you're saying already, if these, they're, the type of drugs that they're taking and using and selling and so forth, but, you know, ingesting, it's going to cause hallucinations. You're going to start going off on these tangents of things like, you know, Satan and mm -hmm. other types of uh, things. So you can't really read into that because you're, it's not being, like you said, you've done enough already research where it's not being backed up by there really wasn't a cult. There really wasn't this going on. So No, not at all. And, I, and I've conducted 50 interviews for this book so far. Um, I've, I've gotten members of Ricky's family to go on record. I've gotten several of Ricky's friends and girlfriends to go on record. And all of them say the same thing. We never heard Ricky talk about the devil. I've heard like one or two of his friends say, yeah, you know, if we were at a party, you know, if he was if he was stoned or something, he, he would jump up and say, hell, Satan. But uh, geez, I did that in high school to get a rise out of people. You know, it's 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 a lot of innuendo, half truths and recollections of jokes that were spun into this idea of of him being this grand master of this shadowy cult. And and it's not based in any kind of truth. And I mean, granted, you know, one thing that did fuel the fire on that is, um, uh, and, and this, this was absolutely horrible judgment on behalf uh, behalf of the cops. Once Ricky Casso committed suicide, they decided, okay, we're going in all or nothing on his accomplice. We're charging him with murder too. So they released his con his confession, his statement to um, the newspapers, Jimmy Troiano's statement. And in it, he says, and I saw I saw Ricky stabbing Gary, and he was saying to Gary, say I love you, Satan. And, you know, granted, you know, to, to people that aren't uh, as well-versed in the case or, not, or didn't know Ricky, they're going to go, oh, my God, he made him say he loved Satan before he killed him. And it's just, yeah. But he was he also had a head full of PCP and acid and whatever right. else that night. You know, you can't take in that context, you cannot take it at face, at, you know, you know, with something less than face value. This is a stone kid terrorizing his victim. It doesn't mean he believes he's, con you know, conducting an organized uh, satanic sacrifice. Right. These are dopers. These were dopers in the woods stabbing each other over stolen drugs. drugs. And and then I would think too that with the idea with no no but none of the other kids uh, that had toured the body as he was mm -hmm. showing him probably wouldn't call the police because as sick and as sad as that it is and it, to even think that 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 no one did for such a long or so many kids did not um, was probably because it's their dealer it's their only source or best source for drugs. And if they're it all was into a, that, right? I mean, 
it's a combina- in my mind it's a combination of that uh i i, w- I would say it's split into thirds it's, a third of it is that you know uh they don't want to you know rat on their source uh another third were completely horrified and they were afraid if they called the police ricky would come and kill them too and the other third i think has a lot to do with this this bully mentality that was rampant in northport around that time this kind of thuggish like Oh, you know, mafioso kind of, oh, you know, we're we're not going to rat on our friends. You know, we don't rat on people. Gary got what he deserved because he stole. And you don't steal from your friends and you don't rat on your friends. Yeah, which like is a mafia the, mentality, keep it in the family. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, which is, you know, the kind of um, mentality that allows an environment to fester where, like I said before, the chief supplier of hard narcotics in your village is... Is uh, is a seventeen year old boy? So disturbing. I mean, the the mm-hmm. whole thing is just really, really disturbing that this went down the way that it did. You were saying that he wasn't a Satanist, and not to put you on a spot because there are people who are going to think of that he might not have been part of a cult. He might not have been, you know, an actual Satanist himself, uh, mm-hmm. but are going to come back with, well, anybody who commits that type of thing has to be under some type of satanic influence. Now, obviously, they're going to have a belief in this. Oh, yeah. Um, how do you address that? The way that I, um, what's a good word for this? The way that I kind of uh, rationalize it in my mind is that Gary Lowers was not sacrificed to the devil but he was coincidentally murdered by someone who fancied himself a Satanist, if that makes any sense. Like, it was not an organized rite. It was not a ceremony with people chanting. There were no incantations or anything like that. But Ricky Casso was a 17-year-old drug addict who had a superficial interest in Satanism. And, um, you know... uh, like it's like the West Memphis Three case in a sense, where you know they said, well, Damien Eccles, you know, he was interested in Satan through reading Stephen King books and Metallica records, so he must have uh, killed those three boys as a sacrifice to the devil. It's like, yeah, well, you know, we, well, first off, I don't believe Damien Eccles did that at all, and I think the fact that he was released on the Alfred plea with the other two is very indicative of that, but um. You know, I think it's possible to separate the two. I believe that, you know, Satan was not uh, Ricky Casso's motive for this. You you know, yes, he he would, you know, jokingly say, oh, uh, hail Satan, I'm a Satanist and all that. But at the same time, he spray painted Satin around Northport. Um, He did not have access to a whole lot, you know, no middle-aged satanic grimoires or anything like that. He, if anything, he had access to Anton LaVey's The Satanic Bible, which anyone can buy. And, you know, if anything, um, one North Porter put it this way. They said it's more of an ode to capitalism than than anything, you know, uh, creepy or satanic. It, uh, but um, he, this kid was getting stuff out of the public library. and yeah. And... Ozzy records so I just I don't really you know granted there would have been I I, I don't know I, I'm not the kind of person to say that even you know p- pulling something out of the library or or these records or anything like that or music videos whatever you want to blame this stuff on I, I don't think it's responsible for the murder I don't think it really influenced him to do it I think he would have he would have murdered Gary if he was a Jehovah's Witness or if he was you know a, a Jew or or any other religion because that wasn't the motivating factor the motivating factor was he was humiliated and angered by what Gary did to him you know Ricky passed out at a party and in front of friends Gary snuck into his jacket and stole from him and Gary was someone who Ricky had known since at least the second grade. I have a class photo of the two of them together when they were, you know, six, seven years old. I have their Little League photo. These kids knew each other. They probably went to each other's birthday parties. And he was infuriated and angered, uh, you know, infuriated and humiliated 
that his friend did something like that to him and decided to kill him. And, you know, the only little bit of influence I think that would, he would have had in that was he decided, you know, to torment Gary while he was stabbing him by, you know, making him say, I love you, Satan, which is just any sort of manipulation. I mean, Richard Ramirez did the same thing to his victims, you know, whether he got that idea from Ricky through a newspaper or his own delusions is another story. But it's like a cat playing with a mouse that it's killing, it in my mind. And massive amounts of drugs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just can't even make sense out of what the mind is going to do at that state and even the motivation for having him say certain things or, you know, like that. Oh, yeah. It just well, you're talking. You're talking about a kid that looked a homicide detective straight in the eye and said, "Yeah." And then a crow caught and told me Satan was happy, and he was dead. You know, he was yeah, uh, ostensibly dead serious about this. You can't take this stuff, you know, as Bible truth. You know, forgive the pun. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes. I mean, it, that to me makes total sense. That um, you cannot put them together. It is an aspect of the story. It was an as. It had to do aspect of him. But it does seem pretty clear that the motivation is simply drugs. A drug, you know, were stolen. Yeah. And this this kid was not just not right. Now, he did this, did Ricky, what was his home life like in, before he was 14? And why did he get kicked out? Of the, did he get kicked out or did he run away? Both. Um, it, it, it's it's a very very tight rope to walk with this because I don't want to come off as blaming the parents too much, but at the same time, there are a lot of cases, in my personal opinion, where the parents of of killers are are given too much the benefit of the doubt when you know things could have been done, you know, but at the same time, coulda woulda shoulda, you know, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But either way, in in this case. And this is, I've heard this from members of Ricky's family. I've heard this from Ricky's friends. The family tormented him. Um, things were relatively normal up until middle school. Um, the father, Dick Casso, he was he was a, a you know a, a talented athlete who became a, a high school teacher. And God, what's what's worse, you know, for for teenage rebellion than having a teacher? As a dad, I mean, you know, the, the deck is stacked against you. Yeah. But um, he was a high school social studies teacher. He was also a wrestling coach, um, a, I believe a basketball coach and a football coach as well. And he just had these aspirations for his kids. You know, uh, one person um, who played Little League with Ricky said, yeah, his father wanted him to be the next the next Willie Mays. He was that dad at the Little League games that screams at his son if he makes a bad pitch or, you know, gets, you know, strike, you know, strike out. You know, he was he was that dad. And as Ricky entered adolescence, he discovered that he didn't want that for himself. You know, he was interested in music. He played guitar. He liked rock and roll. He and, and, and another really funny thing about this that I've discovered is um in the lore of this case, it's, oh, you know, Ricky Casso, the heavy metal Satanist, you know, all this stuff. Ricky Casso barely listened to heavy metal. He His uh, his favorite bands were The Who, Frank Zappa, uh, The Grateful Dead. Yeah, some real hard rock and thrash metal right there, The Grateful Dead. And uh, stuff like that, stuff that's, that's considered very, very tame, you know, by, yeah. by any standard. So he was into stuff like that, you know, uh, and the second, you know, he started showing his father, you know, I don't know if I really want to play, you know, football and wrestle and all this stuff, dad. The dad lost his damn mind. Uh, I, I've been told stories that the father chased Ricky down the street with a pair of scissors because Ricky wanted longer hair. And we're not talking hair down to his butt. The, the, the kid had hair, you know, like the classic beetle cut. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, for that so, time period, too, yeah. Yeah, for the 80s, 20 years after the fact. I mean, come on. You know, everyone had that haircut in, in middle school. Same here. So, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, they were just constant fights. You know, uh, Ricky, uh, Ricky Castle's father's attitude was, um, if you're not doing sports, it doesn't count. 
you know, you have to do this. You need to do that. And any, you know, uh, blowback towards that, any kind of, you know, feet dragging towards that, you know, it'd be get out of the house. I've talked to Ricky's friends. They were like, yeah, you know, we, we were hanging out in, the, in, uh, in our backyard one day. And, uh, you know, the Castle residence was, you know, neighboring to our backyard. And uh, all of a sudden we see Ricky fly through the screen door of the backyard and Dick Casso come out after him. He had thrown him through the door. Um, wow. So and so this kid was was basically becoming a drug addict to kind of, I guess, numb the fact that he was sleeping in the woods for years. It, it's so tragic. I mean, everything. Because, you know, it again, it shows that when crimes like this are committed by people, what the, the murderer goes through, what their life is and their mindset is that leads them to that point mm-hmm. is often um, not, maybe not as disturbing, but very so disturbing that creates that. And that creates that person that we often call the mo- a monster, you know, that did something like yes. this. Yes, I am very much, uh, and that's another reason why I, I wanted to write this book. I am very much of the mind that monsters are not born. Monsters are created. And I, I, you know, and I'm sure I will take a ton of flack for this, but I want to kind of show the world like, hey, you know, Ricky Casso, Long Island Boogeyman, he, he was born a human being like the rest of us. What made him... Right. do what he did and that's what i'm trying to explore with this book how does a a, a middle class normal suburban kid coming from you know ostensibly your average joe kind of family turn into the acid king all right well we need to take a quick brief sponsor break don't go anywhere we will be right back <laughs> Hi, this is Robin Terry from Ashmore Estates. Ashmore Estates is located about a mile west of Ashmore, Illinois. It was a former almshouse or poor farm, and then later a psychiatric care facility. If you're not familiar with Ashmore Estates, you might have seen us on Ghost Adventures Season 5, Episode 1, or in a documentary called Children of the Grave 2 by the Booth Brothers. There have been major improvements to the property since May of 2014. We have electrical, windows, restrooms, a separate team room, and even bunkhouses for overnight guests. I think you'll find the building an interesting place to perform an investigation, either at night or in the day. We also offer photo shoots, historical tours, and a location for movies to be filmed. Check us out on our Facebook page, Ashmore Estates, or on our website at ashmoreestates.net. Hi, this is Sam Moranto, investigative researcher, and you're listening to the Paranormal MD Radio Show. If you're really looking for an out-of-this-world encounter, make sure to listen. Welcome back. You are listening to the Paranormal MD Radio Show, and I am your host, Mary Marshall. I would like to let you know that if you are interested in the topic of paranormal and paranormal phenomenon, you should check out my investigative research website at theparanormalmd.com. This science website contains a lot of information based on science and metaphysics, and uh, you might get some of your... uh, questions answered so go check it out and all guest information is available at the paranormal md radio show.com and you can also listen to past shows there um, and you can listen to the past shows via itunes and or youtube channel we have been talking with author jesse pollock he is the author of a new book that will be coming out called the acid king so now have you are you considering, or have you already, um, I don't know if it's possible, talk to Ricky's family and or, for that matter, Gary's? I, I've spoken with both. Uh, um, I've, I've interviewed Gary's sister extensively. She's uh, incidentally the, the only surviving member of Gary's family right now. And, um, you know, she she supports the idea of the book mostly 
because there was a paperback that came out in 1987 called Say You Love Satan. It was authored by this guy um, named David St. Clair, who – the book's jacket says the true story from occult expert David St. Clair. Well, uh, just to give you like a, a few ideas of uh, what this, this quote-unquote occult expert used to write, David St. Clair was the author's – uh, was the author of such uh, books as David St. Clair's Lessons in Instant ESP and How Your Psychic Powers Can Make You Rich. What? So He was one of those guys, oh. you know, uh, what, what, what we like to call uh, a shuckster, a hack. And he went down to Northport and tried to get people to go on the record with him. One or two did. The rest caught on real quick what this guy was trying to do and said no so he went and he cribbed what he could from newspaper articles and and uh, we already went into how badly the newspaper got the story wrong and then he um he plagiarized heavily from a november 1984 rolling stone article about the case it was called kids in the dark which is a very very good and interesting read i suggest Anyone that's listening to this, go find it. It's on David Breskin, who was the author of the article's website. That's B-R-E-S-K-I-N, David Breskin. And he went down to Northport and stayed there for weeks talking to, to everyone, but but with a big emphasis on these kids, Ricky and Gary's peers, because – you know, the same thing that attracted me to this case, he wanted to know, how does something like this happen? What, what explains the code of silence among these teenagers where a body in the woods can be left there undetected by the police and parents for three weeks, but the kids know? So Was it's there... a very, very interesting read where he quotes these teenagers. He lets them all speak for themselves. Mm. And this guy, David St. Clair, plagiarized heavily from it. So that's why a lot of people, including Gary and Ricky's family, have gone on the record with me because this book that came out in 87 is 90 percent fiction, posing as fact, and they want the real story out there because there are kids on the Internet. I mean, do a Facebook search for Ricky Casso. Look at some of the fan pages that these disillusioned and ill-informed uh, people are making for Ricky Casso. They see him as a hero, a folk hero, a, a satanic martyr. You know, the Acid King lives, man. You know, Gary got what he deserved. You know, he's a cult leader. And it's no. You know, you're wrong. You need to, the world needs to know the true story because something like this could very well happen again. I, I have a newspaper uh, article where a guy who murdered a 14-year-old classmate 10 years ago, they have jailhouse recordings of him talking about Ricky Casso to his dad on the phone. Oh my! Gosh. So it, th this does influence people. I mean, you know, I, I'm I'm not going to get all Tipper Gore and say, oh yeah, you know, scary books and rock records and heavy metal videos are responsible for teenage murder. No, but if you're already heading down that path and you read some of the sensationalized garbage that's out there, yeah, it's 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 gonna it's gonna validate whatever sick things you have in your mind. So it's better. You know, it's better that people know the true facts. This is a tragic, sad story, and it realistically could have been prevented. Yeah, certainly, certainly could have been prevented. It's a uh, yeah. Again, it's it's um. You're talking about the social and the behavioral aspects that leads into you mm -hmm. know something like this occurring. It's not just him. I mean, it was this whole area this whole time i don't want to say the whole town but the kids the period of time the drugs so there's a lot of uh, the home life there's a lot of social um, cultural behavioral aspects that go into the making of this entire uh tragedy oh yeah it was a very potent combination of social apathy rampant drug use and and parents 
pretty much looking the other way. I mean, you, if you really, really want to get into the to the socializ- socialization aspects of this, I mean, this was the era where uh, the breakdown of the nuclear family really started. I mean, the parents just weren't home, True. you know, most of the time. You know, the, the, you know, Northport, like I said, it's an hour outside of New York, New York City. A lot of the fathers were commuting into Manhattan for their jobs, stockbrokers, um, you know, lawyers, etc. So they they were almost never home, and the mothers were entering the workforce. I mean, you know, with the with the big boom in feminism and and female empowerment in in the sixties and seventies, it was all finally starting to pay off, right. and women were being more, you know, not perfectly, but mo- taking more being taken more seriously in the workplace, and they were getting good jobs. I mean, um, you and know, social you know, so you, economics changed during that period of time, which. Kind Very of went much hand in hand, getting in thus women being in the workforce, and mm-hmm. and we didn't have you didn't have back then as much uh, community programs and or support when this is first going on. So you've got a lot of unattended kids. Yeah, and if there were community programs, which there there were a couple in Northport, they were uh, you know on one on one side of the coin, they were dramatically underfunded they they suffered from a big lack of resources and on the other side of the coin even if they did have the resources they wanted the kids didn't take it seriously i mean it wasn't cool to get help you know what was cool was going down to cal harbor park and smoking a joint lace with pcp or you know swallowing some microdots and you know drinking a couple cases of beer and hanging out and you know when there's nothing else to do in northport i mean this town, you know, it, it's a great place to live. Um, it's quiet. Supposedly nothing ever happens there. But there's nothing to do. The kids had a dollar fifty movie theater and a park to do drugs in. And that was it. Yeah. So yeah. it was only a matter of time before something like this was going to happen. You know what? And that is really, I think, a real common thing because that's why a lot of your teens, whether it be uh, the drinking parties, you know, weekend to weekend, who wherever mm-hmm. it's going to be in this field or out at that person's house or whatever, it's because of lack of them having anything else to do. <laughs> you know, well, yeah, well, and these, so they start these, going these were These were kids let off the leash. I mean, you know, and, and, and you, if you read that article by David Breskin, and, and, I, and I hope that my book will put this across too, I mean, these were kids that were walking around and they, they didn't really think anyone gave a damn about them. Their parents were never home. Uh, they weren't taken seriously in school. You know, that, that there's another part of the bully culture that no one really wants to talk about either that a lot of these kids have told me about is that teachers were bullies too. You know, this was this was the era where, you know, if, if you were tired and your head was kind of down on your desk in class, teacher could walk up and smack you upside the head and, and there'd be no recourse for that. If you did that now, you'd go to jail. Right. You know, teachers would encourage fist fights if there were two kids arguing in class. It'd be like, all right, go outside and duke it out. You know, settle this now. This was rampant in Northport, and it's the dirty little secret no one wants to talk about. The environment just fostered nihilism, you know, mm. through kids that were barely past puberty. And you throw drugs into that mix. I mean, and, and you know, you got to remember, too. Ricky Castle most likely was suffering, had to have been suffering from some sort of um, undiagnosed mental illness, too. I mean, there there are, you know, innuendos in some of the newspaper reports that he was at some point possibly diagnosed as a manic depressive and all that. But I mean, let's face it, this is this is the early 80s. Psychology was in its its relative infancy. No one knew what was going on with kids back then. If your kid was acting up, it's, oh, your kid's an ass, or, or your kid's a problem, or or worse, oh, your kid's under the influence of the devil. He needs Jesus in his life. So there, there was no real clinical way to solve some of these problems. And then, like I said, you know, you, you add some more to this to this horrible stew. You add the culture of nihilism. You add the, the feelings of alienation, the feelings of low self-worth, and then top it all off with a real rich icing of hard narcotics. I mean, it's it's a wonder more kids didn't die. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's seriously, you're right about that. You know, I do have a, a question because now... Because we, we've talked about the story of how something happened. 
But weren't mm-hmm. there two? Now you had said this. I thought you had said this earlier. Is that there were two other kid teens present during this murder? Correct. Yeah. What happened yeah. to them? Well, um, the two other teenagers were um, Ricky's friends, uh, Jimmy Troiano, who was uh, 18 at the time. And there was another friend there by the name of Albert Canones, who I believe was 16 at the time. Um, What had happened was Jimmy, Ricky, and Albert were all hanging out in Cal Harbor Park in downtown Northport. Little little park uh, on the waterfront. There's a wooden gazebo there where they hung out, and a um, a wooden children's playground. But no kids went there because all the you know uh, Northport locals referred to these teenagers as the dirt bags. So all these dirt bags were hanging out. They took over the kids park, and um, one of the reasons why they did this was there was a weird zoning thing where. The Northport is a village inside of Huntington. So while Northport Village has its own police department, it's mostly for, you know, issuing, you know, misdemeanor tickets, parking offenses, stuff like that. The Suffolk County Police Department handles the big things, and they later handled this murder. Well, the problem with Cow Harbor Park was, as far as zoning went, Northport had no jurisdiction over this park. That was literally in downtown Northport. So the cops couldn't touch these kids there. These kids could deal and use out in the open, and the cops couldn't do anything about it. Oh, my God. So, yeah. So that's another problem there. Um, So they were hanging out there that night, and Gary Lowers showed up. Um, By all accounts, he had paid the money for the stolen drugs back. There are other accounts that say... That not only did Gary pay it back, but Gary's mother gave Ricky money, and another one of Gary's friends gave Ricky money. So, so Ricky profited off of uh, off of this theft. He was more than paid back. Um, so they hung out. Uh, you know, on the surface everything seemed fine, and then Ricky said, "Hey, why don't we go get some donuts, and then we'll we'll go trip up in in the woods." The woods was called Aztecia among the kids, and that's because there was a. Uh, an abandoned church inside these woods that um, the kids said, well, that looks like Aztec ruins, which became Aztecia woods. Okay. So they, they all went up there. They started a fire and, and um, the murder went down up there. Um, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what happened because all three statements um, are slightly conflicting, but the big um, bone of contention that ended that this is what led to Jimmy being arrested and put on trial was that um, the confessions implied that Jimmy had held Gary down while Ricky stabbed him and at one point Ricky dropped the knife and Jimmy picked it up and handed it back to him um, since Ricky was dead uh, like I said he committed suicide in jail within 24 hours of being arrested um the other witness, Albert Canones, he was granted immunity from the prosecution in return for his testimony. Well, Jimmy got a, himself a really good lawyer, uh, a lawyer by the name of Eric Nyberg. And some of you true crime aficionados might recognize that name because Eric Nyberg also uh, represented Amy Fisher at trial, the quote unquote Long Island Lolita. Uh-huh. So he, he he figured it out very early on. He goes, <laughs> you know, the drugs. Nothing, nothing can be taken as fact here. These kids were on so many drugs that night. You know, we're never going to find out what really happened up there. And and his his uh, tactic worked. Uh, Jimmy Triano was acquitted. So no one ever saw any justice about what happened to Gary Lowers. Ricky took the easy way out, and uh, Albert was granted immunity, and Jimmy was found not guilty. Wow, the whole story is amazing. I and I. <sighs> I am actually, as a, again, an outsider, as a reader, um, really grateful for, for writers like you because this is not an easy um, type of story to take on. How much do mm-hmm. you think uh, you could probably make the reference for The Devil's Teeth and already what you've done for uh, The Acid King? How much research or how much time do you think is involved in have you spent on on either of these 
Have you oh, even well, ever thought about it? <laughs> it's it's definitely not a uh, it's a it's definitely not a nine to five thing. It um it, for me at least it becomes almost an obsession. You know, uh, everyone loves a good mystery. I'm no um, exception to that rule, but I'm anytime I can get a hold of original case files and conduct interviews and get all this data together to piece the story together as it really happened and not as the newspapers, um, you know, the, put it all together so they could, you know, sell copy and all this stuff. It's a, uh, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I, I really thrive on being able to put the true facts out there and give people who necessarily wouldn't have the opportunity a voice in all this. Uh, Gary's family never really went on the record about this. Um, Ricky's parents went on the record, but um, as as people will read in my book, they weren't exactly very forthcoming or truthful in what they told the press about their son and how they you know dealt with the the problems they were having with him. And it's. I mean, it's constant, constant research, uh, seven days a week, from the time I wake up to the time I go to wow. bed. I'm I'm doing some sort of research on this. Like I said, I just got a, I got that package from the Suffolk County Police Department with um, a lot of case files, a lot of police reports and documents that I requested. I'm constantly finding new people to go on the record for this book. People that knew Ricky, knew Gary, knew the cops. You know, setting up interviews, recording interviews, transcribing the interviews. It's a very, very um, extensive process. And um, I, I, I love doing it because I know that the end result is going to be based in truth. It's not going to be, oh, well, I heard this somewhere, so I guess this happened that way. And, uh, you know, if, if if it's not, whatever. You know, there's there's... There's a real stigma with true crime for whatever reason that, like, ah, uh, you know, it's all sensationalized. It's all hack stuff. You know, half of it's made up. And, you know, people like David St. Clair, I'm sure, are to blame for that. And I'm trying to mo move the genre away from that, you know, however little I can do that through my work, because these cases are important. They're an important part of American history. Uh, it's it's a, an examination and in some cases an indictment of American society. There right. are families out there that are still grieving. They want the stories told, you know, by something other than the National Enquirer and all that. And I just feel like it's something that, that needs to be documented with the same amount of care as someone would document any other kind of world history uh, event you know, right. get the data. The data is out there. You know, if you're if you're a writer and you, if you're looking into true crime and you don't know where to start, start with the newspaper articles, get the names out of them, find these people, interview them, get more data. You know, uh, the Freedom of Information Act works more time than it doesn't. You know, don't be too disheartened by what happened with the Jeanette De Palma case with me and Mark. Because like I said, I got more documents from Mountainside about the Greg Sanders case. I just got stuff about Ricky Castle from Suffolk County. File Freedom of Information Act requests. Your tax dollars pay for these documents and for the officers that type them up. You know, go get them. Get the data. Throw the data in a big pile and start working. And and that's my, my work ethic on that. That is amazing. Um, gosh, you know, I, I one, I, I, we're kind of running out of time here. Um, I wanted to, because you are now the new book, Acid King, is through Simon & Schuster. Do you have mm -hmm. a projected release date of that? Well, in the literary world, anything can and most often will change. But right now, <laughs> um, we're looking at fall of next year. Okay. So... Um, there's a little bit of time, but, uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, you know, it's twitter.com slash J Pollock author and Pollock is P O L L A C K. Follow me on there. I, I, I like to keep, you know, my readers and followers, you know, informed on, on what I'm doing, you know, let them in on the process. So if you want to see some updates on how my research is going with this, you know, the, the discoveries I'm making, stuff like that. You know, just to shoot me a follow. And if you got any questions, you know, I always do. I do my best to reply as quick as I can. 
That is awesome. <clears throat> now, do you have, is there any actual other, besides Twitter, do you have a website and or where can people find more information about you, about your books? Um, I, I don't have a personal website because, uh, uh, frankly, um, I don't know how to make one. <laughs> That's my one downfall is I'm from that weird um, c- kind of like I'm on the cusp of millennial i was born in 88 so i still i came up with a lot of analog uh right. equipment and and know-how and so i'm i'm still trying to figure out a lot of a lot of stuff on the computer like i don't even have a smartphone so if you can, are if you, you kidding can get, me i do not have one i don't need one either i'm the kind of guy that would get into a car accident googling random stuff <laughs> you know I- well we we pulled him from the wreckage, and we found Long Island Satan Killer on his phone. I don't know what he was into, but yeah, now it's a no whole nother story for someone else <clears throat> to write. No, but yeah. <laughs> um, so if you want to deal with my uh, my antiquated technical uh, know how with uh, social media and stuff, you could you, you could find me on a uh, on Twitter okay. and uh, see see how well I can put forth in uh, the one the one hundred forty two character limit or however much it is these days. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here again, and congratulations on uh, signing with Simon & Schuster because well, that thank really, you. really, really speaks a lot about what a um, proficient and just wonderful writer you are. Uh, so, well, thank you. So for anyone listening, I highly suggest that you get the, bo- uh, get the book that's out now, which is The Devil's Teeth, and um, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me back on. It was it was an absolute pleasure, and it's it's almost like coming full circle since the the first uh, radio show I did as an author was your show. So it was a, a definite pleasure coming back. And right before we got on air, you had stated today was actually the anniversary of when The Devil's Teeth was released. Correct? Yep. So one year ago today, July twentieth. So everything surreal. Yeah. God, I spent three years of my life writing that book with Mark, and uh, it's 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 just crazy. I mean, you know, we, we for a while we weren't sure we were able we were going to be able to get a deal and get the information out there. You know, in in one spot. You know, we had backup plans. You know, we were possibly thinking of doing it as a special issue of We're New Jersey or putting up a website. But luckily, we were able to put all the information in one concise place where anyone can pick it up and read it. And it's it's available everywhere on the Internet. If, if you're local to New Jersey, uh, Barnes & Noble stocks it. If they don't have one in stock, tell them I told them to order more. But um, <laughs> it's on Amazon, uh, Walmart, Barnes & Noble, w- whichever you Fantastic. want. And it's also on Kindle. So check out. It's a Death on the Devil's Teeth, and it's by myself and Mark Moran. Fantastic. Thanks again, Jesse, and you have a good rest of uh, the evening. You too. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks.